Hello everyone! Welcome back to the channel. Today I have a fabulous guest, Austin W. Crumley. I really wanted to add your middle name. Austin <laughs> William Crumley. <laughs> Welcome to the channel. I'm so grateful you're here. Thank you. I'm honestly really grateful to be here. It's, it's going to be good. It will be, as it always <laughs> is. So my people who are watching, we're going to be talking about what we wish we knew as former professional dancers. Well, really speaking from our perspective as former professionals and teachers, what we wish we knew in our training earlier on. Because, wow, I know like one reason why I like following you on Instagram so much, Austin, is you post so many really insightful tips about how we can approach training as dancers in a way that not only leads to better results technically, but it makes dancing efficient. It helps us with our longevity as dancers. And I love how you, um, in a very fun way through your reels, you um, are really good at addressing some misconceptions and some shortcuts that dancers try to take in their training, you know, with the best of intentions. When we're all young, we're like just trying really hard to be the best we can. So I'm excited today to ask you some questions about your perspective on how we can train more effectively. And I know for our audience, regardless of if you're a recreational dancer, professional dancer, pre-professional, um, you're going to get something out of this. So, oh yeah, shall we get started? Let's do it. Well, first, uh, I'd love the people to know a little bit more about you. So um, we were actually talking before we started recording that um, I like introducing people with all their professional titles because it's we're, we're talking about how um, until you kind of start to have a career as, you know, a business owner, or whatever we do, influencers even, um, a lot of us don't walk around being like, this is my professional title. So I was just going to share what I came up with. Of, you're a fa fantastic ballet instructor, uh, dance educator. Your Instagram account is really great on commenting on ballet culture um, and encouraging people to make positive change there. Um, you are a candidate in a master's program for education or in education and you're a former professional dancer with Sacramento Ballet. Yeah. There are a lot of other things, but we can start there. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot so, of, actually a lot of titles <laughs> that I think of it. You've done a lot of things. I, hey, try not to break your arm slapping yourself on the back, you know? <laughs> so Austin, would you share more about what your career journey has looked like up until this point? Yeah. Um, so unlike many others, I actually didn't start dance when I was little. I started when I was 15 years old. And the reason why I actually started dancing was to cross train for baseball. I wanted to be a baseball player. Um, but once I, um, kind of went through my high school years, um, it didn't really work out for me anymore. And I started just really going towards ballet or dance in general. Um, and once I found kind of like my own little niche in dance and I ended up really enjoying classical ballet, I was like, you know what, let's do this. I, I want to do this. Um, I feel called to do, to do this. So I started really kind of minimizing the classes I was taking and just taking ballet. Well, um, after that, um, someone came from OU and they gave a master class at my studio and was like, you should check this out. You should go check the program out. And so I did, and it ended up being like a really great program, so good that I ended up going there and um, got my bachelor's of fine arts in ballet pedagogy, which is a lot of words to basically say that I got a degree that says I can teach ballet. And um, it's really great because the higher education really allows you to think through what you're doing, critical um, analysis. Um, it talks about like dance history and like uh, even choreography, things of that sort. And, OU is, is definitely a place that brought me up from like where I was, where I started late and it was able to get me to a point where I could be a professional. So for me, higher education was just the best thing possible. Um, and um, so yeah, we can definitely talk about that. But after that, um, I auditioned all over the place and ended up getting a really good job with the Sacramento Ballet and um, did a wonderful uh, roles, did awesome um, performance opportunities, did a lot of balancing work, which is not, you know, you don't normally get to do that in companies, nor do you ever really get an opportunity as a young dancer uh, or young to the company. 
So um, I was able to do uh, third theme and four temperaments. I was able, able to be in Serenade as a blueberry, which was very fun. I know. <laughs> I love that ballet. I got to do it so twice. Good. I feel so fortunate. It's just like, you know, it's a cult favorite. It is. Yeah. And I'm like, New York City Ballet just put it on after, like, I think it was like the first performance. And I saw there was Cheers. like a deal. And it was just like, oh my gosh. There, there's nothing greater than that music, the curtain rising up, the blue lights, the dancers in blue. <laughs> the oh, truly nothing better. It's so really great. Good. Like it's so, and then the history behind that piece is really great yeah. too. We'll talk about that later. Um, so yeah, so uh, the opportunities that were given to me in that company were really amazing. I'm very grateful for my time there. Um, and I also learned a lot from being in a higher education uh, facility um, that was really a rich history in, in ballet, um, stemming from the Ballet Russe um, and uh, Yvonne Chateau, and then going all the way to Sacramento Ballet, which comes from um, old Boston Ballet. And so you have these like two separate worlds that kind of just mesh together. And it was just really cool to see both the really awesome things about that, but then to also witness some things that um, could change, that, that could be better in the industry. And um, so after two seasons, um, my wife and I came to the decision that, you know what, let's, let's start working towards future. Let's start working towards something that can be, that can be better about um, both the industry, but, both, but in our lives as well. So after that, um, I started teaching full-time, which I taught a little bit here and there when I was dancing professionally, but I started teaching full-time. And from there, they, um, uh, I now teach at California School of the Arts, San Gabriel Valley. And it's the sister school to OSHA, which is Orange County High School of the Arts um, here in Southern California. And they are just an excellent art school, arts high school that develop students in the arts. So um, it's really amazing. And this is my fourth year with them. So um, they, uh, oh, then and now I am getting a master's in education. So it's really cool to see as a ballet instructor and uh, um, as a teacher, it's cool to see how education and where it came from and all of these standards and things that make education so great and um, it's cool to see that and then be like, okay, how can I implement this into dance education? How can dance education be far greater? How can we eliminate um, injuries or eliminate uh, biases or stereotypes or you know bad practices and things and just make dance education wonderful? So it's yeah. uh, inclusive too. Yeah, it's like there's so many different things that I'm thinking of and, and with this education that I'm getting. So hopefully the idea is that we can take this education and we can put it into dance curriculum and if if not flip it on its head, at least tweak some things and turn some things into so that the curriculum becomes um, inclusive. Um, everybody can dance. Um, it is no longer, um, it's, it's about the person, the individual and raising them up and lifting them up versus yeah. anything else. So that's a little bit so about me. Good. What a good <laughs> synopsis. And oh my goodness. I have, I, I had like questions at every stage that I know <laughs> probably others were thinking too of like, how did OU prepare you for that professional career within, was it four <laughs> years that you were there? Yeah. So we can talk about that. I wanted to ask about like what you've learned at each stage that now has shaped the way you teach. And I want to ask more specifically, this is me speaking out loud. So I'm like bookmarking them in my <laughs> mind and I have accountability to ask you about yeah. them um, because I'm sure I'm not the only one who's curious. And you just have such a um, interesting, well, a diverse experience in um, different ways of getting educated that I love how you're bringing it back into the ballet world because a little side note that I think is nice, nice to comment on is um, I know so many dancers who have moved on from being a professional or a pre-professional. They just decided to go, you know, straight into another career and they leave with, even if they didn't have a profoundly negative experience, even if it was good, they leave and they get educated in different industries or in different programs, different ways. And they have all these ideas of like, oh, if only ballet um, 
if only the ballet industry knew that, if only ballet training incorporated this, it would be so much better. But because they're in another career, it's not that knowledge and that insight isn't making it back necessarily into making the industry better, which there's no shame in that. Everyone's allowed to have their own life path. But what I really appreciate about yours is that it's woven together in a way that um, you are bringing that enrichment back into your students. So it's super cool. We'll talk as well about um, what you're learning in your master's so far that in what ideas you're getting as to, you know, as for what changes you'd like to see in ballet training to make it more inclusive and yeah. like what you described. So let's start, though, with um, your college experience. I know a lot of viewers have been either they're in college or they're contemplating it for their future. and every dance program is very different. So I'd love to ask about your experience at OU and what were those things within the program that you think most contributed to your success in your training? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I honestly think that OU was a really great experience um, because of what it had, the content that was within the program, the opportunities to perform, the two different strands that you can go down, either performance or pedagogy um allowed you to have some freedom to kind of just decide what you wanted to do later in life um, not that it determines what you do but it definitely that education helps um when i attended there and most definitely now it was one of the top five schools of dance in the nation and so the rigor and the expectations um and just everything that was about that university and the fine arts department was just top notch there was nothing better in my opinion. Um, the opportunities that you have there are really great because you, when you arrive, you're, you're immediately in like technique classes, you're immediately doing things that are going to develop you as an artist, but you're also doing like your general education. And so you're, um, you have multiple pathways as college gives you to kind of be like, oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. Um, on top of doing what you do in your, in your degree. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I was there, I was able to perform every single semester. Now, I know some colleges don't, um, they perform maybe once a year. But mm -hmm. for us, we had an on season and then an off season, quote unquote. So your on season, say fall semester, you would do a big production. And then spring semester, you would still do a production, but it would be maybe a concert dance or it'd be like mm -hmm. some smaller, maybe a uh, partnership with the opera. And you would do um, Onegin or something of the sort. Um, so um, my freshman year, we did Cinderella. And then I believe, I can't remember what we did in the fall or in the spring. Oh, we did On the Town. So we actually did two big productions. So we actually partnered with Musical Theater and we did On the Town. So for me, so I had... Cool. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so I did um, Musical Theater growing up. So it was an easy, easy transition over there. Some of the other like more classically trained <laughs> dancers were, cut, were a little bit rough. <laughs> but for me, I was all over the place doing musical theater when I was younger. So it was very easy. But yeah, so oh, you had those opportunities and continues to have those opportunities. Um, we did, they brought in rep. So um, I know Ailey came in. I know that there was a Cunningham work there. Uh, a bunch of balance chain works were, were done there. Um, we did Vols Fantasy when I was a freshman there. Um, Trying to think of some others while while I was there. I know when I was a junior, Jock Soto came in and he he made an original ballet, and um, I was oh. in it. And it was really cool. It was called Someday Sideways, um, and uh, that was a really great experience. But yeah, so OU is is great because it gives you the opportunities that you need to grow as an artist, but also to grow as a human being, because um, they really do truly care about you as uh, an individual in order to to graduate and get your education and go and, and be into the world. So it prepares you because you're doing performances, you're doing performances that you would normally do in a professional company. Um, they treat it as a professional company. They have one called Oklahoma Festival Ballet, as well as Oklahoma Contemporary Dance, and uh, for both the modern and the ballet department. So you you have to be in the company in order to, to be in the, in the school of dance. Um, now, pedagogy, you don't have to be in it all the time. But me as a as a male dancer, um, I was in it for every single semester except my last semester. I was in every single, um, I was in the company for every single semester. 
Um, so it's really great because you have those opportunities. You have rehearsals like you would normally have. Uh, of course, it's different because you have to, you know, abide by the college times and whatnot. So we had rehearsals Monday through Thursday um, from 6 to 9 p.m. And then we would have Saturday rehearsals as well. So it was like a full time. <laughs> you're not only a wow. college student, but you're also uh, a professional dancer. You're, wow. you're working at the same time. Wow, uh, that does sound yeah. really incredible. And from my college experience, what I learned is something that seems really highlighted in your example, which is that exposure is a really key thing in um, successfully making that transition from student to professional. It's not just about how many hours you train, who your teachers are. Um, it's about how, um, how, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like how relevant your oh. educational experience feels to the professional experience you're going to have. Yeah. Because if the focus is just how do I get good grades, that might deviate you in your outcome from the outcome you need to be at when the focus and the value is going to be placed later on. Um, instead of how do I get the best grades, it's how do I become a versatile dancer, learn really quickly, things like that, which might not be considered necessarily in your final grade. Um, plus, you had the experience of getting exposure to different choreographers. Um, having works choreographed on you or having repetitors come in, it's a like an essential learning experience, really. Oh, yeah. um, in order to make that transition. Now, I don't want to say essential and like terrify anyone who has that <laughs> experience. There's, there's always a way I really hate to speak in absolutes. I try to not do it as much as I can. Um, but yeah, it sounds like that exposure element um, and the way the program is designed to set you up and function, well, it functions like a professional company. That sounds really incredible. So it's not very surprising to me that you are able to make that transition even after starting your training, your serious training a little bit later. Yeah. So that is really cool. Hey dancers, I want to briefly pause today's video to let you know about my services as a mindset coach for dancers. If you haven't heard, I provide one-on-one -on -one coaching to help dancers have a develop a healthy and confident mindset around performing as a dancer so that you can overcome things like insecurities that constantly distract you in class. You know, you look in the mirror and all you see is everything that's wrong, feeling like you're never going to be good enough. You always feel like the imposter, always inadequate. And all these things hold you back from not only feeling confident and enjoying your journey, but also from achieving the goals that you want to achieve in your career and in your training. So if you are looking to overcome those mental hurdles that have been bothering you for a long time, if you're ready to finally do something about it, I am here to help you as a dancer from someone who understands your experience and has tools to specifically guide you that I have evidence that they work in this industry. I've lived through these tools myself and have been profoundly positively impacted by using them. I want to walk you through adopting that positive and healthy mindset as a dancer so you can perform your personal best with confidence and joy. So if that sounds like something you want, I would be so happy to support you. Simply click the link below to visit kirstenkemp.com and learn more about my coaching services. And the next step is to schedule a 30 minute free coaching consultation where you and I will connect, we'll discuss your goals, what challenges you're facing. I will describe more about how specifically I would work with you to get you to where you want to be in the coaching process, answer any questions you have have and determine for you if you feel that mindset coaching would be just the thing to help you feel the way you want to feel as a dancer and achieve what you've wanted to achieve. So reach out. The support is available. Take advantage of it. And let's get on with the rest of the video. Um, I'd love to ask you now about your professional experience, because when you were speaking about Sacramento Ballet, that's when you had shared about um, having some ideas about how you would like the industry to change. So what were some of those things that you thought, oh, I would really like to see this change in the ballet world? Yeah, um, I I don't mean to speak ill of anybody, mm -hmm. nor do I wanna like, you know, put anybody down or whatnot, because I think that the issue at hand is not about a person nor 
um, people, but it's about a culture. And so when, when I speak upon this, I do want to put that disclaimer out there that I will never speak ill of people. Um, yeah, moving forward. Yeah. So, but yeah, so in, in this, um, the reason why I can speak about this is because my peers, um, those who are currently enduring the professional culture and whatnot, all feel the same thing and they're all going through the same stuff. And so for me, I always thought maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just feeling all these things. Um, but then the more that I reached out, the more that I heard other people's stories, the more that I said, no, this is something that's greater than, than just what I'm going through. This is something that is just a, some, a culture that might just need to be shocked and, and upturned so that um, we can have a better one. So some of the things that, uh, that, I, that I witnessed was just like, I think we all go through it. Uh, the, um, the, curtain, the curtain will always have to go up. Yeah, the show will go on. And no matter what you're feeling, no matter what you're going through, you have to just push it and you have to go. And the, the thing about that is that that's, that doesn't really take into account your health. It doesn't really take into account um, your, the importance of you. And, you know, it's great and all to, to be a team player. And I think that that has something, something to do with the success of a, of a team and the success of a company. Um, but at the expense of your health declining or at the expense of your, um, your physical uh, health as well, going downhill, it's not worth it. And there, there has to be a, a, an opportunity for you to say, you know, this is not, this is not going to be okay for me. Can somebody else do this? And then not feel the repercussions of leaders or um, the, everybody else around you to look at you differently. There needs to be that, that feeling of, I am not feeling 110, 100% today. I can't give my all. You deserve my all. So therefore, can person A go in for me or, you know, something of that sort. So that was something that I noticed when I was dancing. Um, luckily, I never sustained a really serious injury. But um, I do remember when I did get injured, we were dancing for temperaments. We were doing an original ballet. And then um, I think that was it actually. But I just remember um, running out and having to do a really quick turn. And then I, I ended up straining or spraining one of my um, a ligament or something in my foot. And I remember feeling it and going, I did something, you know, and, and but I didn't tell anybody because it was a week before theater week. So I thought to myself, there's no one else that can do my role. And uh, surely they're, they're like, people can do it, but then they're gonna have to go around and, be, and figure, out, figure it out basically. And it's gonna be a really big mess. So I just kept it to myself. But I remember going out in the third theme, the first thing that you need to do is go on releve on that foot. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I'm gonna be in pain every single night, but you know what? It's just a week, I can do this, we'll be fine. But I feel like at that moment, it's like there needs to be there needs to be one um, someone there to help watch these dancers to say, OK, what are they doing? How can we prevent injuries? Um, how are they moving? What's the rep doing so that, you know, and then what can I do to help them and assist them so that they don't get injured from this rep to the next? Um, and then if they do get injured, how can we put this person in here? Are they prepared? And so. It's just like this big old cycle. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, th that's just one thing. Um, that makes a lot of sense. That, that wellness, it makes a lot of sense that, um, you know, it's like understandable on both sides. The show does need to go on, but I resonate with your experience that it does feel as if there are very few safeguards or uh, even like a sense of safety that if I bring this up, at least for me as a woman, Am I going to be blacklisted for next season? I won't get my contract renewed because I'm too weak for this or I won't get to perform. They're going to pull me out. They're going to remember this. Um, next time they do uh, another performance, they're going to think, oh, can I trust her? You know, that kind of a thing. It's psychologically really scary. And for me, I handled that far too often by ignoring it just keep going which partially was my personal choice and i didn't i didn't ask um out of fear and partially the fear could be something i can take responsibility for but it is quite ubiquitous in ballet culture that there is um 
it can be very cutthroat in the sense that it's like, well, we need somebody. So if I can't rely on you, it's like, well, maybe I just need like yeah. one or two days. Yeah. <laughs> and can we have the understudy go in for like one or two days? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that I really resonate with that that feeling like a big need. At least it's a desire on my part to see that experience change for others. Yeah. And and in speaking on that and like reviewing that circumstance for example we have dancers that are psychologically going through a lot whenever there's an injury or anything that is like an injury where it it, it has an impact on the performance or the rehearsal mm-hmm. uh, or the time that it takes in order to pr- prepare for that and then you have the whole team the whole company working together of okay well if this person is out then what do we have to do how do we shift around and then the whole thing becomes psychological um, but all of that can be simply changed by, um, leadership noticing the culture, um, and saying, you know what, we're going to fix this. We're going to try or at least we're going to try to go in here and say that if you're injured or if you are going through something, we can have that discussion and it's not going to be a discussion where I'm going to look down on you. If you have that, I think something about, about ballet is that we always try to become perfect. We always try to show the very best of what we do. Uh, and we refine and refine and refine every single day. That's why we have technique class every day is so that we can refine that movement. So I feel as people, we kind of take in, we take in that practice within ourselves as well. And we think that if we go to somebody and we, and we, we present an obstacle to them, that it is not our best. And therefore we can't present that. You know what I mean? It's like, it's very interesting. Um, and I'm sure you could definitely touch on that even more, but it's, there needs to be that comfort level. There needs to be that transparency yeah. and the ability for leaders in the industry to accept what is happening because humans, we're going to fail. We're going to have moments where we are going to be incapable of doing something. We can't always put ourselves up onto this perfect level. There's no such thing as perfect. Like, you always make mistakes. That's how you learn. So it's, right. it's very, very interesting and a very complex web of things that could could be talked about. Um, totally. But I think that's one circumstance that is definitely um, an interesting one. It's it's something that is it's very dear to my heart. And it's like we I very I try to figure out like okay how can we maybe like if we were to create a company from scratch what would we say in the beginning of that, like to our dancers, hey, if you're doing this or if you're feeling this, you ha- you can come to us and say, blah, blah, blah. To us, we see your worth. To us, we see you as a capable dancer. And the only reason why you're maybe incapable right now are because of factors or because of circumstances. Those will go away. Those will, those will wash away. You're still the same person, you know? Yeah. I oh. totally hear you on that. And uh, if I were dancing, I would like to ask you to be my director. <laughs> oh. <laughs> because <laughs> if you'll accept me, I'm kidding. So um, a lot, I think one or two big themes that um, in this situation or this challenge that seems very complex, my kind of psychoanalysis of the matter is if there were just a sense of psychological safety um, and communication, those two things would really transform the experience of directors and dancers. And what I mean by psychological safety, it partially uh, is speaking to the stress level that's inherent in the environment based off of the fear, the fear of consequence. Um, and I notice, um, maybe this is something you've heard about in your master's program so far, or even undergrad, I learned this in a business management course, and it actually changed my life in a way. I learned about theory X versus theory Y management styles, and how theory X, I'm paraphrasing of course, but it's basically the leader is coming from this inherent belief that, um, employees cannot be trusted to act with their own sense of autonomy they need to be told they need to be directed Um, fear and consequence is helpful for shaping their actions and though 
I know that there are so many directors out there genuinely trying to do their best without education on management, communication, psychology. It's very difficult to be an effective leader in a work circumstance that's already inherently very sensitive. You have people who are doing very challenging things physically and mentally. We've worked our whole lives for it. Um, the the practice of doing ballet is also very emotional. <laughs> Being a dancer is very emotional. And so these things need to be handled with sensitivity. And speaking of the theory why style of management, the inherent belief of those leaders is that employees can be trusted. If you give them choice they and coach them in using it well, they will perform much better. The health of the organization will thrive. And... Um, the employees are much more likely to do things not just um, in their own self-interest, but for the interests of the organization. Yeah. And what it requires to be have that more theory why style of management is trust. Mm -hmm. And that starts with a choice. But, you know, there needs to be education, of course. So those are just my observations. I'm totally with you in, in that experience of like, man, if we just kind of felt safe to communicate, that would be... <laughs> <laughs> so good that would have changed a lot um, I mean, so, yeah go ahead you're absolutely right because it's it really does go down to communication and to trust because I mean I feel like dancers they have trust but I feel like we have a different kind of trust it's like the trust that um it's like a, a false trust you know what I mean it's it's we go in there and we we, we give them we give them our life's earnings basically. And because we work so hard to get to where we are. Um, and so we tell them, I'm going to give you my all. Can you give me something back? Yeah. You know, and, and it's, and, and that's all we expect. We're like, can you just give me something, just something? Right. But like we should just be like, I want to give you my all. Can you give me your all? Can we work together mm -hmm. back and forth to create this wonderful art form? And I think that's where theory why I can really kind of come into play where leaders can say, yeah, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to build you up and then I'm going to send you. I'm going to let you do what you do because you are an artist after all. You are an individual. We make up a company, but you are an individual that can make this art form totally. just come to life. Yeah, I really like agree. And just a little tidbit, a tip, hopefully, to the dancers who are watching. Maybe you're like, well, I can't change my director. You're right. The only person we're responsible for is ourselves. And so an insight I would like to share is that before waiting for someone else to start putting more trust in you, there is actually a change that happens in the way we show up, our body language, the way we communicate when we start trusting that our bodies are sending us pain signals and we need to make a plan to deal with them. If you have the trust in your plan of, hey, I need one day, I'm going to talk to the PT, we're going to get this figured out. If you approach some teachers with that confidence, which you might feel really scared and nervous to go talk to your teacher, because we're not sure what they're going to say. We don't know how they're going to respond, and we can't know. But I have seen personally, um, as a dancer, this really worked for me, that when I shifted my confidence to ask for what I need, and I practiced personal leadership. So what that meant is I was um, taking responsibility for my results. I really worked on my confidence so that instead of, um, you know, relying on external validation to make me feel good enough to like be bold, I worked on that self-validation. That really changed my my energy, my body language, the way I showed up to work. And I noticed that I was given more trust and respect. So that is absolutely something that is possible. Obviously, we want a yes and. We need to work on ourselves and we want the industry to change. But I wanted to share that with dancers because, you know, yeah, having an action item is always <laughs> important. <laughs> I feel like that's that in itself, you could have an and because if you work on yourself and you're you're coming and showing up every single day to 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 bring yourself to the point of, I am worth something, I can do this, um, and you're speaking to that, no one else's opinion is going to make any world of a difference. 
as long as you're concrete and firm in who you are, you can go out there and do what you love. And those things will just come like arrows and go poop right off of you because yeah. it won't matter. So we can like, get to that point. That's like a pretty ninja master level point of confidence, <laughs> but like it's possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it absolutely. is. Sorry, um, uh, I don't know if you can hear that, but. Sounds like someone's having a really good Saturday on their motorcycle, but hey, that's okay. <laughs> um, oh, one last thing on this point to encourage the dancers watching. Um, I am very sure that you are the same way as what I'm about to share. As a teacher myself, when a dancer comes up to me, they might sense in my body language, I already see that they're a little nervous when they're like coming up to tell me about an injury. I can feel that that's what they're coming up to say when they shuffle over, I know what's gonna happen. And I try my best to be warm and inviting and all that. Most of all, I'm curious and I ask pointed questions to figure out what do you need? And I right. notice that even when I'm like doing my best to be warm and to make them feel safe to talk to me, um, they still feel nervous because I'm sure in their mind, they're still like, is whoever you are, it could be them going up to anybody else. What are you going to say? You know, we, we have that question and it's normal to feel a little bit nervous. And I see that some of sometimes they're kind of predisposed the younger dancers to thinking that me asking questions is me doubting them so i work a lot to reassure them like i'm trying to figure out what you need because i really want to know how i can help you mm -hmm. i want to know if i can help you by suggesting you um talk to another teacher who has an expertise in physical therapy or whatever it is or uh, point you to some exercises that I know help and then remind you that I'm not a doctor and you should probably see one. Or can I help you by saying, hey, I know you want to keep dancing. I'm thinking because your pain is sharp, you need to sit down. And so I share that example because since we all as humans have our own filters that we're you know, looking through reality, um, we're looking through these filters at reality and it's so easy to interpret body language as you're going to say no to me or assume before you go up and ask, hey, I need this time, I need to sit out or I just need to let you know that this is really hurting and I can't do this mo this movement today. Um, don't assume that they don't want to help you. Even if there are some things that feel like, oh, some signs that are validating, oh, they don't want to help me. If we're bold enough to ask, um, we can find out who are the teachers who might look like just any other ballet teacher, but they actually want to help me. And I think there are a lot more teachers out there like that than dancers discover because we don't ask. Yeah. So I just want to put that out there. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I feel I, on top of that, I feel, especially me as a teacher, that teachers want you to succeed otherwise they wouldn't be teaching that class like they right. they didn't want any student to succeed they just wouldn't teach at all if teachers are teaching they're doing it because they want to see others do the same thing that they did so yeah. it's there there is that at least that small thing that is there with them now for teachers like me i if you look at my instagram i constantly promote others because it's not about me. I mean, I can do great things, but at the same time, I can't do great things. <laughs> um, there are others that can do things far greater than I could. And um, even though I get my feet wet in some fields, like in physical therapy or in science or in other maybe artistic things, other people have those strengths that I don't. And so I, what I love to do is just keep promoting, keep pushing other people so that if by chance you saw my story one day and you were wondering um, is, is there a physical therapist out there that also does Pilates? Because I really love the way Pilates feels on me and want those exercises versus the like, all right, use a TheraBand and <laughs> bam. Yeah, I, I'm going to promote that person for you. So um, good. But yeah, it's all it takes is a question, y'all. All it takes is go yes. up and say, hey, this is what I'm feeling. Can you help me? And the teacher can respond. And if they respond with no, at least you asked. At least you went up there and you and you be proud of yourself. Of yourself. Yeah, you should be proud of yourself for stepping up, being um, an advocate for yourself in that moment, and yes. going for it. 
because I'm all about the- self advocacy. Yes, we are <laughs> worth it. Yeah, so good, so good, so good. Um, and this applies as well to questions about, hey, you made this, uh, you gave this correction. I don't quite understand. What do you mean by that? Oh, I, I'm not understanding. I'm struggling with the stability of my standing leg like and arabesque. Can you help me? You are also worthy of that attention, people. If if like you just ask, you give yourself the opportunity to learn and we give the teacher the opportunity to know how to help us because I think all dancers, we're all going to get older one day and we are going to become the help we wish we had in any sort of field. And when we become that, you and I know from experience that you start just understanding that you want to know how to help people, but we're not mind readers. Yeah. And so it needs to be a two-way street. So anyway, dancers, (laughs) self-advocacy is so important. And yeah, I also have a lot of other questions for you. So (laughs) bring them on. Yeah. Okay. Well, bring them on. I'm going to bring them. What do you think it means to be a good dancer? Oh, man. This is such a great question because being a good dancer just means showing up, doing what you do, love what you do, and then learn from it. Even if it's a class that is so easy, you've done all those things before, there is something new in that class that you can probably get out of it. Now focus on something else. Uh, But anyways, being a good dancer doesn't mean that you have your leg up high. It doesn't mean that you can do the best tricks. It doesn't mean that you get the most roles. Being a good dancer means that you're reliable. It means that you can go in there with your head up high and you can take on challenges. Even if you fail, you took them on. And then you can learn from that. And that's the greatest thing about it. Yes. Being a good dancer just simply means that you go in every single day knowing your worth, there it is again, and um, doing what you love. It's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty simple answer um, for what seems like a complex question, but it, it really is that. It's show up, yeah, learn it. from everything, and then just enjoy what you do. Yeah. Um, I love that part. You know I talk about that. To no end. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. enjoy and um, I've gotten some comments from like other dance teachers on posts where I talk about enjoyment. And I understand like that comment hits differently for different psychographical populations. Big word. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, for some teachers when they've commented they're like well i feel like my students enjoy too much and they don't have enough discipline okay that comment maybe isn't for them i'm really speaking to those dancers who are really serious we want to be technically excellent i'm speaking to a lot of dancers out there who define being a good dancer as being technically at this you know way far off level from compared to where they're at and that's become discouraging it's become like shackles to you um and enjoyment is really a beautiful key out of that and that learning mindset um and i just want to encourage dancers to remember that just like more people are becoming familiar with the idea that success is defined by each of us it is entirely subjective And there are, like, if we look at success, we can ask ourselves as people, okay, what does success look like in my career, in relationships, in my relationship with myself, in my health? The same thing with being a good dancer. We don't just have to confine ourselves to being a good dancer means enjoying ourselves. That is one facet of the diamond, you know? We can say, or learning every day, though both are important we can say, okay, what does it look like to be a good dancer? For me, in my opinion, technically. What does it look like to be a good dancer artistically, in my attitude, in my personal experience of what it is to be a dancer? So it's really a great exercise for everyone to ask themselves that question. So yeah. Ask yourself that question. <laughs> yeah, and you're right. There, it is multifaceted. Like it's not just about the skills that you have, but it's also about you know what how you portray movement. It's about yeah. um, what you do with the tools that are given to you, and how you portray that, and how you you know take it in on your own. 
I mean, after all, we are artists, right? And we are doing this so that we can portray something on the stage or in front of the camera or wherever you perform. So totally. being a good dancer, just for me, being a good dancer is it's just going out there, tackling things, maybe not head on, but tackling things with strategy and also just like free for all kind of a thing. It's, I think it's yeah. very, it can be very um, intricate as well. It just depends on the, on the person. Totally. Now I'd love to ask you about technique because <laughs> so much of your Instagram has, it's loaded with really, really good technique tips and you talk, I don't often see you verbalizing the term like mind body connection, but you talk about how we mentally approach things like forcing our turnout and mm -hmm. how we want to do it anyway as younger dancers for the optics of it because it helps us to feel like we're getting a quick win. But then you talk about the repercussions of that and how to approach it in a better way. That's one example. So I really want to tap into your expertise here in this arena and ask you about how your approach to technique has changed over the years. And in particular, I'd love for you to mention some of the old approaches you used to have to technique <laughs> that didn't work for you. <laughs> yeah. So because I started late, I think technique has always kind of come to me as like, okay, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do this and it makes sense. But when you're young, it's, it's such a, like, if you've always done it and it doesn't, you don't really kind of like get that same approach. So for me, it was different. For me, I had that, like, I looked outside of the box. I kind of had an up, a aerial view of it all, if you would. Um, but yeah, some of the old things, it's like, you're right. It's, we always come into this and we, and, uh, it goes back to the whole culture thing. People expect us to look a certain way or, um, want us to achieve it as soon as possible. And so we want to, it then becomes a culture thing within ourselves of like, okay, I'm just going to do whatever I can in order to get it. So us as teachers need to, need to understand that it's not about getting it immediately, but it's about the process of getting it. And yes. so that's where it really comes in. Old technique, our old training was all about get it, get it fast. If you can't, you're not, you're not worth it. You, you can't have it. And you're just not good at that thing. Exactly. Sorry. <laughs> um, you're just not good at, at naturally that, that thing, whatever it might be. Yeah. And so now that, now that I've looked at that and I'm like, that's not true. Like not at all as that's just someone way up here thinking something and then it trickled down now when we come at it and we look take a look at it anybody can do this it's not it's not just for uh, the elite people or those who can do it because whatever reason but we can do this because we can understand what is good for our bodies and we can understand that if we do if we use first position for example i always in my class i'm like okay whenever you go into your combination, you're gonna step into your first position instead of doing that weird. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yes, I do the same thing. I like teach everyone how to step into first position and like lengthen their legs and then get their hips over their legs. Yeah. Yeah. It's life changing. So that is like game changer right there. And I don't yeah. start my combinations. I, I mean, this is a tangent, but it's totally um, mm -hmm. applicable. I don't yeah. start my combinations until, until I see everyone do that. And if they, if I see I them the in the same. middle of the combination, go ooh, 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 and squeeze it down again, I go, all right, let's start over, y'all, y'all, we gotta break this habit. Oh my gosh, I'm pretty work. sure people think I'm so like militaristic because I do that, <laughs> but I'm like, this is for you. It's not for me. I yeah. don't want to stop the music, but it's for you. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. yeah. So, so to go back to it, um, that old old training or the old technique, I mean, it makes sense, right? We have to look at it from like its origin to today. It's, it came from the royal courts. So you present in front of the king, of course it has to be perfect right away. Otherwise, you know, like you're not, you're not good. So um, that whole idea kind of just trickles down into where it is now. But whenever I teach technique, I always say that I'm gonna teach it to you. I'm not gonna teach the technique, I'm gonna teach it to you. So if your body doesn't go to 180 degrees like my legs do, I have like turnout, but I don't have any like turn in per se. <laughs> don't give I'm, me that face. I'm annoyed and with you. Try and let me do, you know how many balancing works require turn in? 
It's I, I'm sorry. I'm really struggling to have empathy for you, Austin. <laughs> all right. I'll, I'll backtrack here. <laughs> but I'll work on it. I'll work on it. <laughs> it's all a personal right. problem. It's okay. Okay. Uh, Fosse. I've always wanted to dance Fosse. Yeah. Couldn't do it because <laughs> I don't have any turn in. That's so wild. <laughs> yeah. I would get up and show you, but I don't have any space in here. <laughs> I'll give you some of mine. If I, I would if I could. Truly. Okay, can you share? Just, I'll give you some of mine. You give me some of yours. <laughs> I would have it. I could go back and audition for SAB and maybe they would take me. <laughs> but anyway, back to the, uh, the anyway, maybe to... inefficient ways of training, <laughs> how you train it, different, do it different. You know what I mean? Oh, for for my, my dancers, I, I always like, when I show it, I'm very cautious of like, okay, people, you guys don't have my turnout. I don't have your turnout though. I don't have your skill. You don't have my skill. So let's work together. Let's figure this out. Um, so like the example that we said earlier, walking into that first position is a really great example of how I see technique now versus how I was potentially taught the technique. Mm -hmm. now, I had really amazing teachers. I have um, a teacher who was uh, Yvonne Chateau's mentee. Um, mm -hmm. And then I had like Jock Soto came in and did, did class there. Um, I had someone who was trained in the Vaganova Academy um, and then went to Boston and Colorado and then finally ended up being a soloist at Houston. So I have all of these methods kind of just into one. Uh, and then I grew up in Giacchetti, so Italian. Wow. So I have all these methods that kind of just like, okay, I can pick and choose what I like from here and there and then make it my own per se. Right. So that first position stepping in is a great example of how I view technique. Um, of, hey, we're going to do this so that you can manage it in this moment. Um, and this is a great, uh, this is a great thing that I, that I like to do is that whenever you go to ballet class, we instantly think that we need to be this image. But the thing is, is that when you go to a class, you go to a class to learn. You don't mm -hmm. go to a class, you don't show up the class saying, you don't show up to a U.S. history class saying, I know everything. It just doesn't work that <laughs> way. I mean, good metaphor. Yeah, if you're a history nerd, that's great. I love it. I'm a ballet nerd, and I don't know everything about ballet. But when I when you show up to class, you show up to learn. You show up to to be uh, dumbfounded with the information that you get. And so we should have that expectations. Teachers, instructors, directors should have the expectation that their pupils are going to come in with this um, approach of I I know a lot, but I don't know enough just yet. I can't wait to learn more. And so they so come good. and go up and they do that. So like for me, for example, if I'm, um, I take a very scientific approach. And so um, let's do something simple. A pas de cheval. I think if for the beginning of my years, I always talk about your use of turnout muscles, your DORs, steep outward rotators. And for them, I say, okay, this is our focus today. We're focusing on one theme. Don't focus on a lot of other things because we can't multitask. So Right now, in Pas de Cheval, what are we going to focus on? Three things. Once you lift your foot off, you have to go weight over your standing leg, right? So center of gravity, boop, just a little bit. All right, then DOR, same thing. Your DORs in the standing leg are fired up in a different way than the ones in the working leg are. So stability, use that. Working leg, it has to be open. You're using it with movement, so therefore it's a different quality of muscle usage. Mm -hmm. So that, like, that's how I do my classes and it, it so breaks good. it down. It's no longer like, can you show the step again? It's now I'm making you think about what's going on in your body. I'm making you yeah. autonomous in the process. So that's I really my like that. doing technique. Um, I share the same philosophy or at least really similar, I'll say. And um, even if you dancers watching, if you don't have a teacher who takes that approach, I do speak with a lot of dancers and work with a lot of dancers who experience frustration because class feels more like a performance where they're expected to know things. It yeah. feels like there's a lot of pressure and then they get, um, you know, stuck in a lot of frustration about themselves because of that mentality of, well, I'm not getting this and because I'm not doing it, I just must not be good at it. And then I just must not be very good. And then I maybe will probably never be good enough to be a professional, you know? So it kind of spirals into this, grander sense of inadequacy and limitation than it really needs to be if that dancer were actually empowered 
to say, you know what, you hadn't done it yet, that doesn't mean you can't, and if more dancers were empowered with the how, the education, um, in a way that still keeps them moving, because I do know that like one um, shortcoming, I guess, of the more scientific approach that I'd love to take as well is like I'm describing the how and I'm empowering them with education to be independent critical thinkers to be able to you know figure out how to apply and I'll, I'll ask questions of like how is what we did at bar applicable to this movement here if you were to correct yourself what would you say um, if you were to break it down for yourself what would you say um, Sometimes that's really great. Sometimes students super aren't up for it. And it's a good reminder for me too to keep them dancing and keep them moving because not everyone wants like <laughs> the deepest analysis. But for right. you dancers out there who are feeling um, limited in your bodies, incompetent in some way because you're continually seeing the same results you don't like, you can get curious and ask yourself questions. And instead of getting stuck on the why can't I, it's the how can I, what needs to change, what if this could be easier, what if I could, you know, understand what are the fin fundamentals of the way this works, so I know with a lot of our conversation we're talking about teachers and the top-down stuff, but you know, this is also for the dancers who, we're, you guys are the one watching it, you know, maybe yeah. your teacher isn't watching this, so... <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? I mean, if you could drop them a link, that'd be cool. So I was, I want to ask you another question about how your perspective on, um, on, we can go so many different ways, technique, ballet culture, um, how it has changed from dancer to student to professional dancer and professional dancer to teacher now. So I know that was a little open-ended, but oh, yeah, yeah. how has your perspective changed? Um, so dance, and um, but also like technique, it's changed quite a bit. I think as a, as a student, I just kept thinking to myself, I need to get the technique in and then I'll become an artist. I need to, <laughs> I need to work on what it, my skill because I'll, I'll have to rely on that whenever I am asked to do something artistic, like a painter. They need to know how to paint first before they can paint, quote unquote. But sometimes you got to put that paintbrush in the actual paint and then do your things in order yeah. to do it. So um, as a dancer, I always thought that. I was like, okay, I'm just going to get this in and I'm going to work on that artistry like a little bit later or as I go. Um, then when I became a professional, um, I would say that my college years, there was that transformation of like, oh, I can do the same. I can do both at the same time. I can work on my technique and focus on my use of a palmon and how that is incorporating artistry and or where are my eyes going as I do this movement. So tiny little things here and there. Yeah. Um, so as a professional, when, when it was less about, I don't want to say less about, but when technique was there, when, when it was, when it was easily reliable, um, it was more about what are you doing with it? Now, how, are, how can you switch this up? How can you maybe open your legs slightly so you can get that little air moment or like that lift moment yeah. and like, you know, get a certain feeling across. Um, and, but even when I was dancing as a professional, there was still that like, okay, I need to keep it in check. I need to continue it. So the, there's that journey of like, I need to get this. I need to hone in on this skill. And then that artistry transformation yeah. And then being able to rely on said skill to push it, but at the same time also being like, but I could get it better, but I could, yeah. you know, turn this so that I can make it more reliable or whatever. Now, as a teacher, it's funny, I look back at it and I'm, I'm, all, I'm always like, why did I like, why did I worry so much? Why did I, you know, think of that class and go, what, like, I should have gotten that double tour into the, the battery step, like, it's not that big of a deal. And, and instead of focusing on the technique, why didn't I just enjoy it? You know, why didn't I just go in there and just let go? And so now whenever I show something, I have that quality. I'm able to just be like, oh, whatever. One, because no one's going to judge me. And if they do, that's on them. Um, but two, because 
I enjoy what I do. And, and like now I get to show that to students. And if I don't show that enjoyment, it's, it's, it's not going to come across as, as enjoyable. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's a weird kind of like transition. And I think it's like baby steps. And then it kind of goes into like this like branch and this huge thing. So technique or dance as a whole, um, kind of like a weird full circle kind of moment of like, I understand why I did the training. I understand why I was so focused on that. But then if I were to go back, I would tell myself, relax, enjoy it, have fun. <laughs> Me <now."> too. <laughs> that yeah. story arc, it's so relatable. I feel as yeah. if it's almost a natural progression for dancers oh. who have kind of gone through the pretty professional to pro- professional and then after that teaching or otherwise. Yeah. Um, now, I'd love to ask you about speaking to the pre-professional dancers watching and, you know, people who are in a similar space to that, um, for them, what would you say describes like a healthy way for them to work or approach their dancing? I think if we were to go back to what we were saying earlier is knowing, knowing your worth, you've, you've worked so hard to get to this moment. You've, provided so many opportunities for yourself. And so seize this moment, look at this moment as an opportunity to grow, take words with a grain of salt, take opportunities with a grain of salt, and um, don't allow somebody else to determine who you are. You know, you, you're, you're such a beautiful, wonderful artist, a, cre- a creation, and don't let anybody put that flame out. You know what I mean? Like. You have that. <laughs> I just had to give you a little reaction. <laughs> but it's, it's okay. really true because uh, even when I was dancing professionally, there were pre-professionals that would come in and I could just see their flame just go. And it was sad. It was like, yeah, but you're so good. And, and I know right. that you didn't have the same training that I did or that that person did. Or like you, you didn't live my life. You don't have the same maybe like um, assurances that I have for myself. But, you know, you, you're, you are capable of so much. Don't put so much pressure on yourself, you know? I mean, I understand it's a hard, it's a hard industry and it's difficult. And there's like whatever you want to say about the industry. But at the same time, you're in it. And, and you're, you're making the industry better because of that. So for pre-professionals, if you're watching or if you're listening, just, just know that you've done so much work to get to this point. That you should you should feel some sense of pride that you've gotten so dang far and that you've made it this far and um keep pushing keep don't don't allow anybody else to tell you who you are or what you do or how you do it um unless it's to obviously benefit yourself um and then take every single opportunity with one a grain of salt but also two with a little bit of praise and saying yeah i made it I, here we go another adventure i'm on it you know, um, the moment that you allow somebody else's voice to determine your outcome or to determine your future is the moment that you start to sense that spiral. And so, you know, salt, salt and praise, just take it, <laughs> take both because you need them. That was so hard for me to stay silent. I must say <laughs> I wasn't successful the whole time. Um, that was so good. The best pep exactly. talk man if I heard that a couple of years ago that would have really touched me um I know it takes a lot to implement it but um yeah it and I want to say like it is okay this is also something I need to reassure myself of sometimes that you and I are somewhat fresh um in the last couple years fresh out of the industry and out of that life and it is normal to learn a lot in in retrospect and to then really want to like shake people and to say like it do this it'll make your life so much better but also i ask myself sometimes who was actually trying to tell me that and i wasn't listening 
Right. Because I don't, it's so easy to come up with this narrative that no one was helping me. No one was out there. Okay, I grew up like not that long ago. The internet <laughs> was there. There were people out there, um, not so many on YouTube really, but you know, there are resources. There are resources. And I've had to tell myself a couple of things like one, looking into my past it's so easy to kind of glamorize the now and be like if i only knew but i'm like hold on hold on let's be humble maybe a if it was told to me i wasn't listening or if it were to be told to me i wouldn't have listened because yep. it's so romantic to be in that mindset of like the grind <laughs> if i just keep working harder if i'm just harder on myself if i'm more militaristic then all the success I ever wanted in life and the happiness is on the other side and I'll never feel anything bad again. <laughs> ever. Um, so it's important for me to recognize that. Yeah, and even still, I'll, I will say, this is a little bit of a rant, there are still really big um, influencers in the ballet world online who will say things like, quote, no, why is no one talking about this? Why is no one talking about, like, I'm thinking of a specific example, mental health and ballet, I'm like. Well, we are. <laughs> we, we literally have had a conversation. Like, I kind of get what you're saying, yeah. but that language even promotes this idea of like, there's no one and our language does dictate how our, what, how our mind perceives the world around us. Yeah and our experience, it crafts our experience of reality. So I'm like, don't let's stop saying like, I know that seems like a tangent, but I, I wanted to also say like, there okay. are a lot of people watching that will get a moment of encouragement from that. And I do wanna say that suffering is not nice. It's not cool. You and me, we wanna spare people from it. And ultimately we can't fully right. and there are so many lessons that I just want to say it is okay to learn from messing up, from getting oh, yeah. advice and not applying it. Because when we recognize it through the hard times, through failure, that's when we really learn it. So I do want to say as much as you and I are like, let me spare you from all the suffering <laughs> in the world. It still will be there, and I just want people to know that, hey, if you just get a little encouragement from this today, um, that even there is hope for you that even if you go through hard things in the industry and in your training and then recognize in hindsight all the things you could have done better to make your life easier, um, life on the other side is still great. And having those learnings doesn't need to turn into regret. It turns into wisdom if you let it. So that's my that's my little addition pep talk. Yeah, I actually want to add on to that. Yeah, please. That they're like we just because we're doing this work, just because we're out here promoting and trying to really like provide an environment where there is no suffering. This is the world we live in, and there will be a sense of 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 suffering or a sense of where you have to go through the muck and you mm -hmm. have to go through the hard times. Um, no no fix will ever prevent that. But the coolest thing about some of the hard times that we go through is that that's where we learn the most. And that's where we can come out of it with character development, where we can see moments of, ah, uh, I, I understand now, or, yeah. you know, things of that sort. And I don't mean to belittle anybody's, anybody's uh, experiences in life or anything totally. of that sort. I know people have hard times, no matter what they go through, harder times than I've gone through. I just know that when I went through the darkest moment in my life, coming out of it, I, in reflection, I look at those moments as the, as the defining moment of why I do what I do. Okay. And so it's very interesting to see how a dark moment in my life transformed into this, okay, you know what? I wanna make sure that no one feels this, or if they do feel this, they feel support, that they, yeah. they know that someone is there that has gone through that or that is currently going through that or that just wants to be there for them because that's what yeah. this community is all about. And there's always, um, I mean, if you think of Mr. Rogers, there'll always be helpers. Look for the helpers, right? Yes. But we're here doing this. Um, yeah. Check both of our accounts. For me, you can always come to my account and I will promote those helpers. 
no matter what. Like that's mm. that's why I'm, I do what I do. So so good, so yeah. good. I think some of the best things that we can <laughs> we can actually aspire for or towards as helpers is that um, the people we help will have different problems than us. Yeah. Because the reality is we're all going to hit rock bottoms in our ballet journey and in life. And I resonate with that experience too, that the rock bottom felt like that's where the seeds were planted or that's when they really started to grow out of those ashes yeah. that turned into blessings I experienced today. <laughs> and so people, we're all gonna experience those super low moments. And I think progress looks like instead of hoping for others or we hope for ourselves, like, man, I wish for a problem-free life, a problem-free career, all this stuff. Sometimes happiness is found in accepting that there is no such thing as problem free, but what we can do is help each other and help ourselves to improve the quality of our problems and our growth through each challenge we face. That I think is, it's a worthwhile aspiration in life. My God. <laughs> We, it always gets really deep in these these conversations. It's good. Like at the point where probably five people are listening. Hey, yes. <laughs> if you're one of the five. Good job, five. That was, that, that was your reward to sound kind of egotistical there. <laughs> um, ooh, so good. Um, okay, so to close up, I have two questions. One is funny. What is, in your opinion the cringiest technical faux pas this could be actually i'll expand it it could be technical it could be behavioral in like serious dancers so uh man i'm like trying to trying to figure out if you need a minute i have one i need yeah i'm like trying to think I also really used to do the thing that I am going to share. It's the, oh my gosh. I used to roll my leotard up to like, oh, way over my hip. And it was just so cringe because, okay, listen, my legs are already long, but when you're like 15 and really insecure, they're never long enough. Oh yeah, of course. Oh, oh, but I look at that and I'm like, no and i see it now <laughs> i see girls doing it now i'm like please for the love of god like stop so that was one of them technical though like honestly i just like part of me dies on the inside when i see people like drastically forcing their turnout because also, I used to do that, and that's how I dislocated my patella three times. Oh, man. So I look at it, and I'm like, so triggered. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, hopefully that gave me some time. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, as a teacher, I think it's it's just, like, cringiest. It's so funny because there's just, like, so much. But I'm, like, trying to think. Whenever you try and think of, like, the cringiest or, like, the one, it's so difficult. I mean, I could go back to to the rotation. Um, you know what my favorite one is, and I can't I can't say this like because I, I know that like balancing technique, you you kind of like lift your hip a little bit. But my favorite one is Alasabesk. Alasabesk. Don't do it. When you can like see the foot. It's like, <laughs> yeah, oh, that yeah. looks so disturbing. I was way too good at that. That was scary. <laughs> I think you, what you need to do is you need to go back and just do like a slow. Oh, pan. I think I will throw up. I don't think I can do it, but someone out there is probably oh, man. don't pause. If you know it's bad. If we are like cringing in our seat. <laughs> like, I'm the place. But I see it still. And I always like, I always just call it out. And I'm like, guys, we have eight body positions. 10 if you're including a carte de vent and mm -hmm. derriere and a pole and a face. Please don't add an eleventh one. <laughs> don't do all this. You have lots to choose from. Just yeah. stick with the eight. Let me just like demystify this for you guys. Okay, so Alas Abesque, if you're not familiar with it, it's the between of Arabesque, which should be directly behind you, 
and a la second. You're using basically <laughs> your abdominals like to lift your leg. Like in between <laughs> moment, and it's like, oh my gosh. first of all, you're not going to from a from a teacher's perspective. Ready? You ready for this one? If your leg is right behind you, and you can, you know, it's always there. It's reliable. You can you can do a jump. You can do a turn. You can do whatever you want to do. You know that your leg is right behind you. I don't know. My all all Sebastian feels very reliable. <laughs> don't with me. <laughs> <laughs> if your leg is and uh, and the reason why I always say it's behind you or like you should be behind you is because anatomically it makes sense. Yeah, big word meaning for your body and like musculature. Yeah. It makes sense to keep it behind you. And I can go into this, like, this is part of my class. I love talking about this, but like planes and whatnot, if you're calling uh -oh. up. I really cool. set something off. Going through, you did, yeah. You weren't Whoops. ready. Whoops. No. Sorry, I'll, I'll keep it short. Anyways, but if you keep Are it Are you right, going to make a reel about it? I will, actually. Yeah. Uh, go once call in, folks. I'm not as busy as I am right now. All these technical things are going to come out. I'll give you all my secrets. It'll be great. Okay? You guys ready for this one? I'm so, ready. yeah, so... If you keep your leg behind you, one, it keeps you on your center of gravity. You can maintain it and control it. If you have it there at 90 degrees, your glutes are gonna work for you to get that leg up. It's gonna be nice and good. If you keep it out here and I'll say, I'll say, wait, what is it called? I'll say best. <laughs> it's in that weird in between. You can't, you can't control it as well as you can something that is in that mid zone. That but it gets so much higher. I'm sorry, I'm being really annoyed. <laughs> so yeah, it does. I mean, going back to going back to the first position thing, mm -hmm. it's a quick fix. It's a quick it fix. Is. I'll give it to you. Your leg doesn't yeah. get higher. But yep. are you correct? No. No. And the reason why you're not Thanks. correct is, yeah, there's a lot to it. But you're going to get a better movement. You're going to have better movement quality. You're going to have a lot better positions and you can rely on it a lot better if yeah. it's right behind you. Um, Consistency and, and results <laughs> and the, the slow payoff. I know. I know. I know it's that slow payoff. There's that payoff though. If you like that. watching the Royal Ballet people, how do you think they got there? Patience. By being like very patient, very methodical. Patience. Okay, my friend, one last question <laughs> to wrap this up. <laughs> What advice would you like to give pre-professional dancers who feel a lot of pressure to um, be perfect and to push their bodies past their limits? Uh, my advice is to reflect. Um, and it sounds odd that in order to move forward, you have to look back. But I promise you, if you doing the reflection will cause you to feel such great satisfaction with yourself and this gratification to just acknowledge your journey and then to know and to witness how far it took you to get to this point and that accumulation of knowledge will only make the journey forward faster because you came to this point yeah and then also you're going to have this viewpoint of like ah I, I know that I came from here and I know all the obstacles that I just came over and then now I know what's ahead of me. So reflect. That's one. Always yeah. do it. Always. Two, just set some goals for yourself. And I don't mean like, I want to be a prima ballerina. That's awesome. You do that. <laughs> but you got to have some smaller goals too because, you know, there's a really great African proverb in order to make a bundle of sticks, you just got to pick up one at a time. So one stick by stick, yeah, makes a bundle. Okay, so yeah. make those small goals. If you want to be prima one day, what do you got to do right now? Or if you can't think forward, think backwards. Prima, okay, what comes right before the prima? Mm -hmm. okay, what comes right before that? And you just set those goals for yourself because then you can make even smaller goals to get to that small goal. It's like, it's so good, yeah. right? It's amazing. Yeah, it's simple. Like, make those goals. And then always have those opportunities to treat yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Sit down, get yourself a cup of coffee in the morning if you like coffee. Um, whatever you do yeah, to treat yourself, do it because you're worth it, right? You, you've, yeah. you've gotten so far in this journey. Um, 
allow the voice that speaks to you be a voice of compassion, a voice of love, a voice of kindness, gentleness, yeah, all those things, yeah. y'all. Those are the important ones. The voices that speak anything else, you don't want those voices in your head. Okay. Love but that. yeah, pretty professionals, you're worth it. you you've done so much. I am so proud of you. I don't even know you, but I know the work that you've done. Yeah, and that that work is some hard work. So from yeah. one professional and a teacher. Two. Excuse me, from two professionals. You can speak for me too. Yeah, we got, we are so proud of the work that you've come yeah. and to accomplish. And we know that you're going to do far greater work yeah. uh, and far more work than what you've done in the past. You just got to know that we're here for you, that we are supporting you. Yeah. And we'll always bring every single piece of resource to help you out. And uh, you're not alone. Truly. It's a, it's a fun, it's a fun career. It's so fun. Mm. But it's challenging. Yes. Over here. Thank you for sharing that, Austin, and for sharing all this wisdom. Such a good conversation. And I know that so many dancers will really be touched by it in ways that each of them uniquely need to feel supported. So thank you for that. Thank you for being generous with uh, your care for dancers. I really want to thank you for that because your compassion, your care, your heart really comes through in your work. And I think that makes you unique and very valuable to the ballet community. So thank you. And I would love to ask you, where can people follow you and find you? And I know you have some programs. So if you want to share anything about your work and what you'd like to kind of point dancer dancers towards, let us know how we can follow yeah. up with you. Yeah, for me, um, if you want to support me, that's awesome. Go for it. Um, <laughs> uh, just follow. That's all I ask of you. Just follow along um, because this journey is a fun one. I'll always give you as much as I can, um, whether I'm busy or not. I'll, I'll keep giving because it's where my heart is. Um, I do have some programs that I tend to do during like my times off. And so in the summer, I plan to this past summer, I worked with a friend of mine and we did a collaboration where she was a um, she did a lot of like athletic training and really kind of formed the dancers to get the strength and flexibility and mobility that they need um, for the upcoming season. And then I with my knowledge in it, I pulled that and then I put it into their training and I allowed them to make the connections. And so that was like a four week process. And the dancers came out so good, so strong, just like completely different dancers. It was amazing. And I know we had competition dancers. We had a classically trained dancer. So it was really cool. So um, good. To be determined, I'm not a winter one. It's like a smaller version. But uh, so stay on the, on the lookout for that one. And then, um, yeah, I, I'm looking to make some collaborations with people so that the resources just become super available for you. So, mm -hmm. um mental health therapists, um, psychologists, physical therapists, people who are local here in Southern California, but also um, all around the world. I have friends in Australia. I have friends in uh, England. I have friends all the way in like just random places because of Instagram and it's so cool. Yeah. So wherever you are in the world, um, just come visit my profile on Instagram. That's probably like my hub is yes. come say hi, DM. I would love to chat with you and say hi back. Um, if you need anything, just reach out and I'll try and push it. I'll try and get it out there for you, but that's where you can, you can find me in any program that I come up with or that I'm a part of. I'll put it right up there for you to see. Beautiful. So. And so generous, very on brand. <laughs> awesome. Well, I will have your Instagram profile and links and everything on the screen and in the description box. Austin, thank you so much. You're real, you're a real chum, a real pal. And um, I'm sure others who aren't even getting to talk to you live, they feel it too. They're like, Austin, my friend, yes. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for this conversation. So and um, yeah, we'll say goodbye. Goodbye for now. Ta ta for now thank to you, everybody. everybody. <laughs> oh, was that a, a queen away. thing? Yeah, okay. Well, thank goodbye. You thank you for watching. Okay, bye, everyone. Yeah.